Hi, welcome. Um, it's March 9, Monday. Um, basically, today we'll continue with um, one episode which I will title um, What Should Investors Do? Um, it's not been a very um, bright Monday, um, not a good start. Um, this itself is not a map showing where the um, COVID-19 is. This is basically a heat map showing the uh, percentage falls on the various major equity markets uh, across the world and the ones uh, on the right which represent Asia are the live ones um, around lunchtime, Singapore lunchtime. Um, the numbers are not, are not very nice um, as we can see. Um, the reason behind it is basically the situation uh, within OPEC um, which has caused uh, oil prices to drop by about 30 over percent uh, in a single session. Um, that combined with the coronavirus fears um, really is hammering markets at this particular point. Um, so this episode, well ideally should have come a bit earlier but uh, touches on this point um, whereby um, we want to try and uh, identify what investors should do if they have a view of the markets coming off. If you remember in the last episode itself, um, we actually uh, highlighted the, the, the expectation uh, that markets could have over the short term because of what we call um, the market uh, under discounting, um, uh, underestimating the risk from COVID-19, potentially another 10% or even up to 15% decline uh, back down to a particular support line on the S&P and likewise on the other markets too. Um, and thereafter, it would actually be a situation whereby whether that decline in the markets, the slowdown economically, whether that would lead to what we call a domino effect um, on other very vulnerable factors in the markets itself causing what we call a, a, a cascading effect which eventually would lead to systemic risks and maybe even a decline uh, in markets from here as the cycle turns. Um, but again, we will actually just focus on the short term, which is if we see markets going down over the next one to three months, um, what should investors do? And basically, this is what we're going to try and answer today. Um, it's not as simple as if we see markets declining, then everybody should just sell and get out and, and stay by the sides and, 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 side and go into cash. Um, actually, what determines your course of action really um, is dictated um, by what type of investor you are. Um, if you have a view of the markets which is negative or bearish over the next couple of months, and if you're a short-term investor, then basically um, you are actually, um, your strategy is actually market timing. And I'll talk about that a bit later. If you're a long-term investor, then basically your strategy, um, what you do will, de will depend on whether you're a passive or an active, uh, whether you adopt a passive or you adopt an active strategy. Okay, so let's go into each and every one of them to understand a little bit more so that you can actually um, um, understand what actions you should be taking rather than just a blanket action of coming out altogether. So um, just briefly on the short-term investor, as you all know, we are not short-term investors. Um, we basically are more long-term. But for a short-term investor, basically it's all about market timing. So if the markets are coming off over the next couple of months, you will have some short-term investors looking for opportunities to sell and then to buy back again, to sell, to buy back again, to sell and to buy back again. Basically trying to pick the bottoms and tops of what we call the volatility in the markets. There will be, however, some um, short-term investors who prefer to just sell um, and wait for what we call a, a good level to come back in again or to cover those, those shots. Um, so they will be either a type of A type or B type of uh, short-term investors. Yeah. But for us, um, we are more long-term and in the long-term itself, you'll find that there are two types of investors. One is the passive investor, basically those who um, do not 
actively manage their portfolios. Um, these are a little bit more of like ETF investors who believe that over the long run, just merely holding a, a good composition or diversified portfolio uh, will actually provide them the necessary returns. Um, so for passive investors, basically if you're a passive investor, you're invested in, in ETFs for example, even if you're invested in unit trust but you don't really do a lot of active management and you believe in just holding it over the long run, then basically this situation of seeing the markets potentially come down, you're not going to act because that's your uh, assumption, uh, your minimal uh, or even zero uh, active management of your portfolio and just let it ride through with the markets itself. So what you get is basically if the blue line is the index um, and the red line is your portfolio, your passive portfolio and even if you're here in this red dot uh, and over the next couple of months we're coming down, uh, you're not going to do anything because you believe in riding through the cycles and at the end your point B uh, will be higher than point A and that's what really uh, you're looking for rather than trying either to time the markets in between or to do any active management in between. So that's a passive investor. So if you're passive, basically uh, you're not going to do anything or you're most likely not going to, do, going to do anything. If you're an active investor, then basically um, what you do is you probably try and aim uh, to reduce the volatility in your portfolio. Um, active investors basically have two, two things that they want to achieve or two objectives. The first objective is if you look at the, where the cursor is, um, over the long run um, a portfolio is supposed to move from point A to point B um, and the market is the blue line. Uh, if you actively manage your portfolio, you would try and get alpha and basically hope that you don't end up at point B but you end up somewhere in this cross here, some point higher than point B. Okay, that's so you, you try and outdo the markets by creating what we call or generating alpha. Um, the second thing is as an active investor, you also try to reduce volatility, which is the green line. Uh, compare that to the blue line, which is the market line. So again, um, your two objectives will be a higher return and less volatility. Um, in this particular episode itself, we'll focus a bit more on the volatility rather than, than the target or alpha itself, which is a big debate in the markets with regards to whether active management can generate the additional alpha. So that's for a different time and place. But, but today we are focusing more on trying to reduce volatility. Uh, for example, if you're here today in this red dot um, and we look at markets coming down, uh, rather than come down according to the blue line, which is the market, uh, an active fund or an active portfolio looks to actually lower the volatility and not fall as much as the market, i.e. having maybe a beta which is less than one. So how do you do that? You actually manage volatility actively by either do doing what we call portfolio allocation, type of holdings or a combination of both. Uh, under portfolio allocation, it's very clear. Um, if you have a portfolio which is diversified into bonds and equities, um, in order to reduce volatility, you start moving away from equities and putting more into bonds. So for example, if you have a 100% equity portfolio, uh, to actually take some risks off the table and lower your volatility, you move maybe 40% into bonds. Uh, you could give, even go a step further and try to move into what we call alternative investments. Uh, so again, the managing of the allocation itself will help to reduce volatility. Um, the second way of doing it is actually to change the type of holdings that you have. A very simple example would be to move away from uh, high beta stocks to low beta stocks. For example, the more defensive healthcare sector and so on. And you could even do this via funds. This is just an example, uh, a graph of a, of a fund uh, where in a, a, a volatile market, uh, because of hedging, um, the fund doesn't fall as much as the markets itself. Or thirdly, you can use a combination of two things. You can also you can um, uh, manage the portfolio composition, and you can manage what's inside the portfolio itself in uh, in order to achieve uh, lower volatility. Uh, let's focus on the type of holdings. As we mentioned, there is the change in allocation, which is I think quite simple. You change from uh, equity to bonds and into alternatives. And then there's the change in the type of holdings that you have. 
So for retail investors, when you adopt this approach, um, you will find that it's actually very challenging because there are not many funds out there. Uh, most funds that are available to retail investors are long only funds. Um, there are very few funds out there that you will be able to try and mitigate the risk by lowering volatility. Funds that go opposite direction, funds that have low correlation. Yeah. So they are. Um, but you really have to go and uh, uh, sieve them out and look for them um, and in this episode we'll try and uh, look into uh, three or four different types uh, so that you have an idea that um, out there you can actually buy some unit trust or funds which will help to lower the volatility of your portfolio. Uh, we will outline their funds uh, without naming them. Uh, do note that past performance is not an indication of future performance. And if you need any more information about the funds, please look up your financial uh, alliance consultant who will be able to help you on this. Okay, So let's go to the first one, uh, which is uh, funds that are defensive by strategy. What do I mean by this? There are certain funds which uh, do not have what we call the typical long-only mandate. Uh, these funds have slightly wider mandates, mandates which allow them to, for example, hedge against volatility. So whenever the fund manager himself or herself sees volatility in the market, he or she will actually uh, put in place certain hedges, probably using derivatives and so on. So the derivative is not to speculate, but to actually hedge against volatility. Um, of course, on the flip side, the fund manager could make a mistake and hedge when uh, the hedge is basically not necessary. He thinks that there's risk, but then the market continues to go higher. But because you've hedged it, uh, you lose out to the upside because you don't partake in that upside due to your hedge. So again, there's, 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 the, the, the knife cuts both ways. Um, if the fund manager makes a mistake, um, the hedge goes against the investor. If the fund manager actually gets it right, then the hedge actually protects the portfolio. Let's look at an example. Um, so by defensive by strategy, this is a particular fund that's available to retail investors. Um, I've taken two, two periods. One is the volatility that we saw in the last quarter of 2018. Um, this fund itself um, actually held up about 1.5% uh, despite the peers of the MSCI world declining by 15.1% over a three-month period. And recently, uh, all the way one month from March the 5th to 2020, uh, the MSCI world has declined by 8.9% and this fund is only down 0.2%. Because why? Because the fund manager has decided or had decided to hedge the fund against volatility. So this is one a good example of um, having uh, an exposure, for example, to global equities, uh, but choosing a fund which um, has the ability to hedge when the fund manager sees risk. Uh, but again, be reminded there's two, it, it swings both ways. The fund manager could make a mistake and not participate in the higher performance of, of the markets. The second is defensive by safe haven attribute. What do I mean by this? Certain asset classes like gold, for example, uh, they have traditionally and historically been seen as safe havens. So therefore, naturally, when there is turmoil in the markets, people go to gold, physical gold. Um, um, gold mining companies, paper gold, so to say, uh, uh, has what we call a correlation with physical gold because gold mining companies' revenue is derived from physical gold prices. Uh, um, the only thing, the only difference is there's a cost element to it because all companies have costs. But anyway, um, um, the the gold mining companies itself, you can actually purchase it um, um, in a diversified portfolio via a unit trust fund. Um, so that would give you some sort of defensive qualities if you you plug that into your portfolio. Uh, because um, again, as I mentioned, um, gold tends to move in opposite direction whenever there is a risk premium or there, rather there's risk in the markets. Uh, just to show you an example, if, uh, same time frame, going back to the last quarter of 2018 when the markets tanked by 15.1% globally, um, this gold fund itself went up by about 10.5%. Um, today, um, the markets have actually dropped until uh, up to March the 5th, 2020. For a one month performance period, markets have dropped 8.9%. This gold fund is down 05 um, Do note, there was this period here where the gold uh, fund uh, correlated 
back again positively with the market because by right the market goes down this fund is supposed to go up um, there were some technical reasons for this people have tried to explain it um, I won't go into details but what I'll say is I don't expect this to be the norm meaning to say I think it will still hold through that go and 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 go mining shares will move in the opposite direction uh, to the stock market uh, as the example was in late 2018 so this is more of a normally here uh, whereby the prices actually um, um, correlated back with the equity markets. So I think this is just a one-off thing and I think gold prices, if the equity markets continue to go off, um, the gold mining companies will do well. The third one is actually defensive by asset class. So this is very clear cut. This has got to do a little bit with the first method of going defensive of, or lowering volatility, which is to move into bonds. Um, when you move into bonds, basically you also need to be careful. Um, the bond market is not homogeneous, meaning to say that it is not just one bond market. It is the bond market is there are several different types of bond, all the way from high yield bond to to high corporate grade bonds to uh, uh, low duration bonds to money markets and so on and so forth. Yeah, so basically you need to pick and choose. Uh, we tend to be a bit more comfortable in the front end of the curve, and that's where we uh, it's called a short duration. Uh, short end of the curve. Um, it's less sensitive to interest rates. Some people may argue that today since interest rates are falling, monetary policy is being loosened up, you should try and take advantage of what we call um, long duration bonds which will go up much more when interest rates come down. But um, I think to play safe and we feel much more safer in what we call the short duration bonds uh, which we feel is a better place to be uh, amid the, the, the big turmoil that's going on in the markets today. But let's have a look at what's what the uh, short duration bonds have done, uh, how they did uh, during turmoil. Uh, in the last quarter of 2018, uh, this short duration actually kept up at 0.5% doing its own stuff despite the fact that the markets fell 15.1 and this time around same thing 0.5 despite the fact markets went down 8.9%. So basically, this is uh, you know uh, a place to go to as a real pure safe haven. Um, you know the returns are not a lot, but really it's in a situation whereby not losing money is making money. So this would be something which is comfortable for certain people. And lastly, by design, so there are certain um, um, unit trusts out there which are quite unique because by design they are, they are meant to try and go the opposite direction of the stock markets. So basically by using uh, instruments uh, like derivatives and so on and so forth, uh, they try and deliver what we call a negative correlation with, with stock markets. So just to give you an example, there is actually a fund out there. Um, uh, please excuse me, this one should actually be called Fund 4 and Fund 4. Okay, so Fund 4 itself, um, in the last quarter of 2018, this fund actually uh, went up 9.3% when the global equities went down 15. Uh, over the past one month to March 5th, 2020, this fund actually went up 11% as the stock, global stock market tanked 8.9%. Okay. Um, again, you need to be very careful also because when global stock markets go up, this fund goes down. So uh, it's basically something to use as more of a hedging tool, something to put, plug into your portfolio um, in order to lower down the volatility of your portfolio. So the big question is how much do I put in and what do I put in? Really, that's a case-to-case -case question, meaning to say um, you would need to meet up with your financial advisor. Um, and you and your financial advisor will have to look into your existing portfolio to see what suits um, your existing portfolio, how much to put in uh, to your existing portfolio in order to lower volatility. So I think really very much that's the situation now. It's not a blanket kind of uh, situation where you put everything in, it's really depending on a case-to-case -case basis. Uh, unfortunately, for retail investors, there's very little what we call a uh, true non-market correlated investment, investments which don't correlate at all to both equity and even bond markets. Uh, however, if you're an accredited investor, uh, this is uh, less challenging because there are funds out there, sorry, there are funds out there which are available to accredited investors, investors who uh, fulfill certain criteria 
uh, based on the MAS uh, criteria of accredited investors or high net worth individuals. Uh, you are able to buy into funds like private equities, um, um, uh, secured lending and stuff, uh, which have no correlation at all or very, very low correlation at all to the equity markets and the bond markets, which is really what you want. But unfortunately, it's only available for the accredited or high net worth individuals. Okay. Uh, those of you who would like to know more about the suitability of some of these funds or some of these uh, uh, different unit trusts which I mentioned, um, whether they fit into your portfolio or the availability of some of these accredited investor funds, please do uh, ask our uh, Financial Alliance consultants and they'll be more than happy to help you. Lastly, um, I hope that has been useful for you. Um, I know markets are quite volatile, so I'll try and do a little bit more updates uh, uh, more frequently. Um, please subscribe if you would like to keep updated with regards to um, the, the episodes ahead. Uh, once again, thank you and I hope to see you again.